Um, so thank you everybody for uh, joining us. Um, first, I just want to spend a um, minute to give an introduction for the rules of the webinar. So the webinar is open to the public. It's being recorded and it's live streamed on YouTube as we speak. Um, so all participants, of course, you're welcome to ask questions, but during the presentation, I would just ask uh, uh, clarification questions. You can raise your hand. Um, if you want to ask questions, also write in the chat room. And so our the panelists is going to monitor the chat room as well. So today we're honored to have Doug Breeden as our keynote speaker. I'd like to welcome our also like to welcome our uh, two of our panelists, uh, Bjorn Iraker from University of Wisconsin and Maury Frank from University of Minnesota. Bjorn is also an academic director at MFA and Maury is a past president at the at MFA. Um, Doug is someone who doesn't need an introduction in our profession. He's an associate professor of uh, editor of all three top finance journals, and he's a founding editor of the Journal of Fixed Income. He was elected to the board of directors of AFA in 2010, and he's a lifetime fellow of AFA. The International Association of Quantitative Finance named Braden the financial engineer of the year 2013 for being an industry pioneer. In addition to his prolific academic career, Doug is also has uh, many experiences and successes in the financial industry. And he was a co-founder and a chairman of uh, Smith Britain Associates, a money management firm. He's a managing director of the Amudi Pioneer Asset Management, and he's on the board of trustees of Common Fund, a money management firm for, for nonprofits. Doug was my <laughs> dean when I first joined the Fuqua School of Business <laughs> for 14 years ago. And he's currently the William W. Priest Professor of Finance at the Fuqua School. I bet Doug didn't realize it's been 14 years because he hasn't <laughs> aged bit in 14 years. Um, despite all of the achievement in his career, when I asked Doug to for a bio, the first paragraph he gave me is not any of the above successes. He, you can look at the conference brochure, the first paragraph is still about his current research. So Doug is always most proud of his current research, well, which we are very uh, honored to have the opportunity to, to share today. Doug, the floor, the floor is yours. Thank you, Angie. Uh, uh, it's certainly an honor to be uh, invited to be a keynote speaker for the Midwest Finance Association. And I accept it immediately and I thank you for this honor. Um, I have never learned how to put together a, a short presentation because whenever I uh, put them together. I want them to be logical and cover all the different points. Uh, so I have uh, in front of me like 57 slides and I will skip many of them and just pick out a few uh, or maybe 30 or 40 that I'll go through. And we'll have some time for questions at the end, even with that. Uh, so I'm talking about uh, using essentially what Bob Witzenberger and I uh, worked on in 1978, uh, actually even in my dissertation at Stanford. Uh, which was using option prices uh, to extract state prices. And um, I'm gonna use uh, option prices for bonds, uh, interest rate caps and floors, and also for stocks, uh, just uh, options on the S&P 500. Um, I've got some results for uh, not just the US, but for the UK and for the Euro area as well, with regard to interest rate caps and floors. Uh, I've always been interested in this area, and actually, uh, you know, I've had a, a pretty unusual career and it was pretty straight academic until uh, 1982, I started Smith Breeden. By 1992, that was taking so much time that I gave up tenure at Duke and I went out to run Smith Breeden from 92 to 99. And we built a $10 billion uh, money management firm. And then I thought, oh, I can come back and I can be an academic now and I can afford to live the way I wanna live. Uh, and I came back to the academic world and right away uh, Duke asked me to, to be the Dean. And so not only had I been out from 92 to 99, kind of uh, working in business, I then became a Dean and everybody knows that whenever you become a Dean, your IQ drops by at least 30 or 50 points. I think all academics count on that, it's usually true. Uh, so I was Dean from 01 to 07. So I'm kind of, I had a 15 year gap uh, there uh, where I wasn't really, uh, doing a lot of research, although I did, uh, I did edit the Journal of Fixed Income 
and focused on fixed income during that period. Uh, so I, I kind of got back into things after stepping down from the uh, dean's office in 2007, uh, but still I had this big hole in my knowledge. Uh, and uh, my interest perked up whenever Bob Blitzenberger called me in about 2012 and MIT had asked me to come and be the uh, Fisher Black professor for, uh, for a year, it became two years and I was at MIT. Blitz won this thing, Financial Engineer of the Year. And he said, uh, Doug, would you introduce me uh, at the big uh, gala party? And so I said, okay, sure. He said, because I think it's our work together that kind of caused them uh, to, to like me. Uh, so uh, so I, I started getting back into the fact that people were using what we had done uh, back in 78 on option prices. And uh, that's where this really started. When I started looking at what was being done and it turned out that central banks were using our model and I didn't even have a clue that they were doing that. Uh, and when I looked at it, I thought, well, you know, I think I'd do it a little bit differently. Um, so then by 2013, you know, I started writing this, uh, some of it by myself, some of it with Bob, um, and, uh, and this is an outgrowth of that. And since that time from 2013 to now, I've spoken to central banks about some of these results uh, in, in the US and in the UK and France and all over uh, Asia and uh, South America as well. So that's been, that's a bit of my journey uh, on what I'm gonna talk about today. I was always fascinated, of course, uh, being a Stanford product. Uh, I was kind of in the West Coast world of state preference. And so our gods were uh, Ken Arrow and, and Gerard DeBrew uh, doing state preference models. And of course I got into continuous time modeling and following Bob Burton's work and John Cox's work who was on my committee. And Bob was a teacher of mine as an undergrad at MIT. Uh, so I kind of combined the two of those continuous time and discrete time models. Uh, but today is about state pricing largely and really picking up on uh, what I started on. Really it's embarrassing uh, 40 years ago or uh, 42 or three or four uh, years ago. And uh, to refresh your memory, and I'm just, I'm going to, it's going to be like a motion picture because I know that many people have to study this uh, in PhD programs and studied it long ago. But essentially what we did was uh, in, a, in one slide to say, look, if you have call options with a strike of two, three, and four, if you take a spread of the, uh, the two minus the three and the three minus the four, and then the spread of those spreads and have a butterfly spread, you can get a pay set of payoffs uh, that are basically arrow securities that just pay off $1 um, in a certain state of the world. And in this case, it's if, it's if the asset uh, hits a price of three in a year, if the asset underlying asset can go from one to six, uh, a spread that's long a two, uh, strike of two, short two threes, long a four, gives you this arrow type of payoff. Um, I remember talking to uh, Ken Arrow one time about this and said, we're applying your model here. Uh, and uh, that's been one of the problems. Uh, and he was pretty happy about that. So we showed that basically if you, uh, in that paper, uh, if you took the differencing interval to very small levels, then this turns, then the spreads are like slopes and the butterfly spread is, uh, is like a second derivative. And we showed that you could, uh, you could price derivative assets with a, a density function that was the second partial derivative of call option pricing function, or you could have the second partial derivative of a put option pricing function and price derivative assets that are based upon those. I think most of you, most of you know about that. Um, now, if you assume that the Black-Scholes model was true, we had a table in there that basically said, you know, if the stock market starts out at one, you can price contingent claims if the stock market, let's say, drops 20% to uh, between 80 and 90%, uh, the price of $1 three months from now you could get would be uh, 13.1 cents. Um, and you could kind of price those for six months, nine months, and right on out. And of course, since the probability spread out over time, uh, the prices spread out over time as well. Uh, so this is a uh, uh, this is part of what we had going and you can price, if the Black-Scholes model were true, you can actually price these securities as just uh, the price of a zero coupon bond uh, times the N of D2 
uh, evaluated at one end of the interval minus n of d2 at the, end of, at the other end of the interval. So you could come up with these prices uh, in a formula that's straight out of Black-Scholes almost. It's, uh, it's built on that. And uh, as I say, when I kind of came back from those Rip Van Winkle years, uh, when I was uh, dean and in business uh, full time, uh, I was kind of surprised also that uh, even Freakonomics had uh, quoted somebody, from Eric Zeitzowitz from Dartmouth, I guess, and he had drawn uh, these uh, distributions of, um, of what uh, S&P 500 prices could occur as of September 2008. They were forecasting the S&P level in 2010, so like two years later, and uh, then as prices moved down from September 30th of 08, where the S&P was 1166, moved down to 735, the whole distribution shifted over to the left. And uh, so this is where he was picking up on it and saying you could use our technique to quantify what they thought were basically the probabilities of disaster scenarios of the S&P 500 going not just from 1166 to 735, but maybe down to 400 or 200. Uh, and you know you could draw these uh, density functions out from option pricing functions. Uh, so it was good to see that they were, they were using that. Uh, now, what Litz uh, told me is he went to Goldman Sachs and was there actually, uh, I think when long-term capital uh, kind of went down uh, and saw some of these option pricing models used in practice. And, and he said that, you know, if you parameterize them with just one, two, or three factors, uh, they can be very substantially off on the tails uh, in, in pricing the distribution. Uh, so we wanted to basically do a more non-parametric uh, uh, approach to uh, you extracting uh, state prices from option prices. And uh, the first application that I worked on was really uh, using it for bond options, interest rate caps and floors. And uh, basically I used, used it there to kind of extract um, uh, state prices for different levels of interest rates and show how central bank actions when they came in and moved really changed not just the level of the 10 year rate or the level of the three month rate, but changed the whole uh, state price distribution. Um, and uh, that's what I got into. Now this, I have a couple of slides here, which, which were the ones that I was so surprised by that in 1996, when I was out running Smith Breeden, the Bank of England was using our approach. And I thought, oh, this is pretty cool when I saw that. Uh, and uh, here's another one uh, uh, for the Bank of England as well. And then the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis was, was using our uh, model uh, to price essentially distributions for uh, commodities like grains as well as gold and uh, stock options and interest rates. So uh, that kind of inspired, uh, inspired us. There were actually many articles of central banks uh, using our type of technique. Uh, but when I saw what the, uh, like the European Central Bank did, this was February, 2011, they had an article that they published uh, drawing the distribution for uh, the state price distribution from option prices for interest rates. It was practically a spike um, in, for short-term interest rates just over three months. And indeed, if you imagine after the financial crisis, when Bernanke's Fed took the short rate to zero and, and finally convinced people that they were gonna keep it there for a long time, uh, then the distribution over three months isn't very interesting. It's either gonna be uh, like exactly the same at zero or it's gonna go up by a quarter or something. Uh, so I didn't think that was very interesting. Uh, those were very interesting distributions. Uh, so I had traded with Smith Breeden a lot of interest rate caps and floors, and there were maturities of two years, three years, four years, five years, seven and 10 that were actively traded. And I liked those long-term options. Indeed, whenever I looked at stock options and even traded in them sometimes, I thought I can move those prices around with some small trades. I mean, they were pretty bad on some stock options. Now that's not true with S&P 500 now, uh, but options market are not as liquid as you'd like, although the, the big ones are uh, there. But anyway, um, I wanted to essentially use longer term maturities and not have to parameterize. So 
key disadvantages uh, that they use short-term options, just like three-month options. Uh, and to me, that just wasn't so interesting as what would happen out two years or three years or five. Um, now, what we do in this work that I'm talking about today, I'm gonna to talk some about both um, using bond options and using stock options. And for the bond options, actually, I'm using Bloomberg's uh, prices and Bloomberg uses a volatility cube. So to be honest about that, they are already smoothing it by using their volatility cube. Um, if you use actual traded market prices with bid ask bounce and things like that, uh, with you, if you do butterfly spreads, you can get some negative prices, some ne negative st state prices with butterfly spreads based upon traded prices that are bouncing around between the bid and the ask. Uh, so we use Bloomberg's volatility cube estimates on that. Um, for the interest rate stuff. On the S&P 500, uh, they have good data and they, they print, um, they print um, uh, implied volatilities by moneyness uh, for 80% uh, up to 120% uh, of um, the current price. Uh, and I feel like there we're using more directly uh, the uh, actual traded option prices there. Uh, to remind you kind of when uh, if you looked at payoffs on call options uh, and you take a spread of those, it looks like this, a spread of the three, four, the spread of the four, five looks like that. And the butterfly spread, if you don't have discrete payoffs, but have continuous payoffs, then it's a triangular payoff. Uh, if you go like long a three, short two fours, and long five, it ends up being triangular payoff with zero below, zero above, and it peaks at one and has a 45 degree angle. So what I was playing with at MIT, and I remember when I, when I uh, got into some of this, I'd run down the hall and talk to Bob Merton a little bit and uh, say, uh, you know, look at this, what do you think? And, uh, and you know, how can I make it better? Um, and basically one of the things that I thought is, okay, if you get a triangle by doing a one, two, three butterfly, you get this triangle, a two, three, four, this one, uh, a three, four, five butterfly uh, and so on. If you held up one of each of those portfolios, one of each of those butterflies and add them all up, it turns out it ends up being a trapezoid, uh, trapezoidal payoff. And then I thought, okay, I wanna turn that into something that is a riskless payoff where I know then what the values must add to. So I thought, okay, we can add a tail spread that's like long a two, short a one uh, that, that has that type of payoff and long an eight, short a nine, and has the right tail payoff. Add those to the trapezoidal payoff, and then you essentially get $1 for sure all the way across. So that, it, so that you know then that if you break it up into those, all, those, um, all those triangles as pieces, and then you add two at the two tail spreads, uh, then the prices of all those should uh, sum to essentially the riskless uh, bond price, a zero coupon bond price. And if you divide by that, you get essentially a risk neutral density that must uh, sum to one. Uh, so this is an illustration of that, uh, where I just actually got the prices of, uh, of options and or of interest rate caps and floors. If I get a five-year cap and a four-year cap, I take the difference between the five and the four to get the price of the payoffs in the fifth year. Uh, those are caplets, I guess. And uh, and then you take butterfly spreads of those caplets. Um, and these are the prices that we come up with on the spread costs for all those uh, butterfly spreads We're right here. And then you'd add to it uh, the tail spread on the left tail and the tail on the right. And these, this should sum up to the zero coupon bond price summed up to 0.977. If the interest rate was about 2.3%, that's, that's about right. That should be that to avoid arbitrage. And if you divide by that total, you can get essentially risk neutral probabilities. I like to, I never liked risk neutral probabilities uh, as, an, as a name very much. I'm a state price fan. I think those are, those are not real probabilities. Uh, they're state prices and state prices reflect both probability and marginal utility uh, in them uh, quite essentially. So I think of those as more uh, insurance prices. Now we had one issue that that of course comes up, uh, which is that these are these butterfly spreads have these triangular payoffs, and what we might be more interested in 
instead of the triangular payoffs um, is something that's like a digital option that has a $1 payoff in a range. And that's where my, my teacher and co-author, Bob Litzenberger said, hey, I'll bet if you, uh, uh, if you assume that the risk neutral density is linear within the rate range, uh, then the value of the digital option will equal the butterfly cost. And he was able to prove that. Uh, uh, so uh, the old guy could still, uh, could still do a nice little proof there. And he did that on this one. So, so you can basically compute the prices of those butterflies. And if it's a, a butterfly, like a 2% butterfly spread, which would be long a one, short two twos, long a three, uh, you can, his proof would basically say that that 18 cents should be the price of something that pays off between one and a half and two and a half, one dollar. An arrow security that pays off between one and a half and two and a half should have that same price. Now that's an approximation, and indeed you can show that it can't, uh, it, the linearity assumption can't really be true as a macro inconsistency of that, but it's not a bad first approximation. So I'm kind of using that in the back of my head all the time when I say I'm using these triangular payoffs to price arrow securities. Uh, now, when we do that, I'm gonna jump into graphs that, that are a little bit easier to, to look at. Uh, I first said, okay, let's get this data. And I got data back to 2003 on interest rate caps and floors. Uh, let me zoom in on the US prices there. Uh, and for year end 2003, four, five, six, and seven, I drew out those prices and uh, from options at each of those dates and graphed them. And you can see that all five graphs really have a pretty symmetric distribution there. It was symmetric in 03, it was symmetric in 04, five, six, and seven. You know, there's one over here that either looks like a lot of tail risk or a data error or something, uh, but generally it's pretty symmetric distributions where uh, the market was kind of pricing, uh, peak pricing on 5%, four and 5% uh, uh, payoffs. And that was pretty sensible that LIBOR was often four to five percent. And so that being uh, the highest price security made a lot of sense and falling off on the tails because those were less likely. If you did that with the data that we had for the Euro area, you also got a, a pretty symmetric distribution in those five years is a little tighter actually uh, than the US, not quite as spread out uh, but, uh, but peaked at uh, three, four and 5% also pretty plausible. And the British pound uh, did the same thing and had pretty symmetric payoffs too. So, all right, so that was kind of before the great recession, before the financial crisis. And then, then let's uh, go to that. And that's when with the financial crisis, uh, Ben Bernanke's Fed, uh, became very active. You know, I know Ben, we were young professors at Stanford together uh, and uh, associate professors, I think, together out of Stanford. And uh, he did a pretty impressive job there. Uh, so what I did was basically say, let's look at the different announcements for the Federal Reserve, uh, 2008, 2009. This is up to 2020. I've given this talk for, for several years, something like it, and I always update to the current crisis or the current issues. And what you see, like in 2008, this was the, the uh, state price distribution in June of 2008, or, or insurance prices. I like insurance prices as a, as a, better, um, a better phrase for that, because if you want to buy insurance for rates being 7%, you would, you would buy this security that pays off of rates or 7%. If you lost a million dollars, you could buy a million of those and it would cover your risk. Um, and they're selling here for like eight cents uh, is what it's showing. Um, so this was the distribution. Actually, and I'm quite surprised at this, June 30, 08, it was pretty symmetric even then. Why am I surprised? It's because bad things were already happening by June of 08. Uh, Bear Stearns had gone down in March of 08 and got sold to JP Morgan for $2 and eventually $10 a share. Uh, so, and cracks were beginning to, to be clear uh, in the housing market as well. Uh, but still, the markets must have been pretty optimistic that in uh, this is three years, that in three years, rates would be four and 5%. Uh, 
uh, and you know, presumably life would be pretty normal. And then, uh, of course, Lehman Brothers went down in September, and all these transactions, Merrill Lynch, uh, you know, sold to uh, Wells Fargo, and all these uh, Washington Mutual failed, lots of places failed, all the, uh, everything happened there. And then in October, uh, there was one week I remember Financial Times had uh, uh, stock markets across the world were all down 15 to 20 percent in one week. So things were plunging in October and November, and it was a scary world. And that's when Bernanke's Fed stepped in in December, slammed rates down to zero. Uh, and by December 31, then, this was the distribution that, that uh, they drove it to. So you can see that it all stacks down on uh, less than one and a half percent on very low rates. Uh, and then it has very long tail positive skewness. So this is not normal at all. And if you were trying to price options, uh, you know, the Black-Scholes formula would be off quite a lot uh, in pricing interest rate options uh, there. It's not log normal, it's not normal, uh, I would say. So, so this kind of comparison shows the impact of the central bank's uh, actions. Now, that's what was going on in the U.S. in 2008. I was kind of surprised when I looked at Europe that while the U.S. is down here, this is the same graph, and the U.S., you know, turned turned in that way uh, from symmetric to uh, positive skewness. Europe in December of 08 was still quite symmetric. So Europe had not been hit uh, in the eyes of the markets. Um, and you can, you can see that uh, by these comparisons there. Now, Europe got hit a little bit later though, of course. Uh, now, before we get to Europe, I'll throw in a couple more for the US. This is one in 2011, we had a budget impasse where uh, I think it was President Obama and the Republican Congress were playing a game of chicken on the budget. Um, and the markets plummeted like 13% in a week. Stock market dropped 13%, interest rates dropped sharply. Uh, the Fed was very worried. And so they came in and, and they had previously said, we're gonna keep rates low uh, for a long time. This time in 2011, in uh, August, 2011, they said, we're gonna keep them low until the end of 2013 two and a half years. Now, I think that specificity and long time commitment, committing for two and a half years, really caused the markets to move, where they had not moved as much uh, earlier when Bernanke had said, well, we're gonna keep rates low for a, for a long time. Uh, so it kind of shows the Fed that their communications do affect these uh, distributions of what uh, market prices are. Uh, 2013, of course, we remember, uh, the taper tantrum and Bernanke uh, said in May, you know, we may, we may start tapering this year uh, because uh, uh, real estate's coming back. The markets are looking pretty good. The economy's in better shape. He said that again in June uh, and you can see the markets move. So in this case, it was the markets before were uh, positive skewness and then they shifted to uh, towards a more symmetric normalization. Uh, so the Fed's comments there on tapering, move the markets between May and uh, September 2013. Uh, so, uh, you know, what I'm really just trying to do is show you that you can use the option markets and their prices to extract uh, the impact of the Fed on uh, interest rate um, state prices or interest rate insurance prices. Now, I remember uh, talking uh, with um, I talked to Steve Ross about some of this, and I talked to uh, uh, Bob Witterman, I think was the one who was kind of giving me a hard time to, that I was, and Bob may be uh, listening in here, uh, that, uh, that I was talking about them as if they were probability distribution shifts. And so I said, no, of course not. These are, you know, I'm an old consumption-based asset pricing guy. Uh, I, uh, I know about marginal utilities and that that affects, uh, that the betas affect asset prices. Um, and indeed, with interest rates, I thought uh, something that I've worked on long ago with interest rates is that, and I even have a quote here that I dredged out of my 1986 paper, uh, where I did a synthesis paper on interest rates. And it basically says that uh, the betas of interest rates can flip signs, can go from positive to negative, uh, because we had just seen that. Even in 86, we had seen in the 70s and 80s, 
that uh, we had big recessions in 74, five and 81, 82, where rates went up and uh, bond prices went down and stock prices down. So bonds had positive betas then. Uh, whereas prior to that in the 60s or so, if you had a Phillips curve uh, for in inflation versus unemployment, you would expect more of a demand oriented relationship where if the economy is strong, inflation would go up, interest rates would go up, bond prices would go down, stocks up, bonds down, negative beta. Uh, so, so we could see then uh, that indeed sometimes bond prices uh, should have positive betas or did have positive betas, sometimes negative. And you know, several years later, we see graphs like this, which is a correlation of um, uh, treasury rates with uh, the stock market, S&P 500 was negative and then became positive in about 2000 has been positive most of the time. Now I would cast that as like supply oriented inflation. Um, and, and this one is more like demand oriented inflation. Now, I think uh, John Campbell and uh, a couple of others, Campbell, Vicera and Sundaram, I think, I think I mentioned him here, uh, developed a model also where the Fed changed its policy function and changed the correlation. All right, well, why am I talking about that? The reason I'm talking about it is because if you think, uh, are these distributions, um, like uh, we'll go back to the 2008 one, um, are these state price distributions good estimates of probabilities? And I'd say, well, surely not. Uh, not necessarily. We think they're affected by probabilities, but also marginal utility. And indeed, if uh, when we had very low rates, it was because uh, we were in a recession and, or the markets were worried about a recession and the Fed stepped in and dropped rates uh, to a very low level, then this is a recession scenario. And if you bought a security like uh, that paid off in very low rates, uh, the beta of that security would be, would be negative. It pays off when rates are low, which is when consumption is down. And so it's got a positive payoff of consumption down, negative beta. Uh, negative beta, so that should have then a very high price because it's quite a diversifier. And oh, these over here, if rates were five and six percent, then the world was probably uh, normalizing and in good shape. And so these have positive betas. Uh, so uh, these would be high priced, these would be low priced uh, in, uh, uh, in a CAPN type of world. Um, and so what you see is that, uh, that sometimes those those probabilities should be biased high. In this case, these probabilities should be biased high, or not probabilities, these state prices should be biased high estimates of probabilities, and these should be biased low estimates of probabilities. Um, so that's, um, uh, I just want to point that out, that as we look at a lot of these graphs, um, it's, uh, these are not probabilities, these are insurance prices, and people pay for insurance more when it's insuring against a bad event. Um, now, if you go to Europe, you can also see, I also did some similar type of analysis there um, and looked at the different uh, things going on in Europe. Of course, the big, big one in the last 10 years or so for Europe uh, was a sovereign debt crisis. It started out with Greece having its problems and then people worried about Italy and Spain. Um, and that happened in 2010, 2011, 2012. And in 2011, Mario Draghi took over. Prior to that, Jean-Claude Trichet uh, was heading the European Central Bank. He actually raised rates uh, while the US was holding them down to zero uh, there. When Draghi came in and bad things were happening there with, with Greece and worries about Spain and Italy in 2011, Draghi immediately took rates uh, down uh, near zero right away, cut rates twice in 2011. And you can see how the distribution prior to Draghi uh, was pretty symmetric. And again, he just kind of slammed it down to zero uh, with, uh, uh, with the drop in rates there and, and picked up the positive skewness that the US had. Uh, so uh, again, the point is that these option prices show the impact of the central bank on these distribution. And when, of course, Draghi made the, the dramatic comment uh, as people were worrying that uh, the euro would fall apart. 
He said, we will take, do whatever it takes to defend the Euro. Uh, that included buying, helping out the, uh, the bonds of the weaker countries like Italy and Spain, buying those bonds. And indeed that moved the rate distribution as well. Uh, so central banks had quite an impact on these distributions. Uh, let me fast forward to the present and conclude this part uh, before saying some things about uh, the uh, stock options and say, what are the markets saying now? I mean, you know, we have a pretty dramatic situation going on right now uh, that started in, maybe started in January in, in China, uh, but the US didn't pay much attention and seemed to be much affected until March. And then we kind of panicked. And this is the coronavirus pandemic uh, that of course is uh, ongoing. And what you see is of course, when, uh, when that happened, uh, Jay Powell's Fed came in and immediately dropped rates back down to zero. They started turning dovish like June of 19, even before the pandemic. But when the pandemic came, came about, they took rates straight to zero. And you can see the price of the payoffs that pay $1 if, if LIBOR is less than one and a half percent in three, three years, they moved from 40 cents up to 90 cents, 95 cents even right now. So the Fed has convinced the markets that they're keeping rates at zero for three years uh, pretty, uh, pretty firmly and that uh, 95 cents out of 100 is being paid for that security, that payoff. And you can see how it just dropped off a cliff uh, for the 2% securities, the 3%, 4%, you can't even see, 4 and 5. Uh, so the Fed has, again, moved the uh, uh, distribution of state prices. If you look at the 8 to 10-year distribution, I think that's a little bit more interesting because we know that the Fed is quite committed to keeping rates basically at zero now and, and doing massive stimulus, quantitative easing and such. But in eight to 10 years, you would think maybe it would normalize and rates would go up. And indeed you do see that as, as we go from, uh, the first bar is December uh, of, of 19. The second bar is, uh, is at the worst time, three March 27th of 20 worst time in the virus. And now we've got July 31 where stocks have bounced back and there's a fair amount of optimism about a vaccine and all that. And you can see that the 2% securities dropped from, let's say 22 cents down to uh, 14 cents and back up to 18 cents. So they're coming back. So the markets are beginning to think that rates might go back up to 2% um, in uh, uh, eight to 10 years. Uh, but the uh, four and five percent ones are really still still sharply down, so that's the way the the uh, distribution has moved um, in uh, this year with the coronavirus pandemic. Now let me say some things about the stock market options. For the stock market, basically, I look at securities uh, that um, uh, that uh, I think of it as lottery tickets, like Arrow. Securities, uh, a lottery ticket A1. You could you could even buy a hundred million of treasury bills and kind of strip them into payoffs where lottery ticket A1 pays one dollar if the S and P 500 is down 12 and a half percent or more. So that's the left tail, 12 and a half percent or more down. Uh, lottery ticket A2 uh, gets payoff of one dollar if the stock market is down seven and a half to 12 and a half. And lottery ticket three, two and a half to seven and a half. So these centers are like center of down 10%, down five, zero, up five, up 10, and then the right tail. So I kind of break it into several states like that. And then I use the uh, data from Bloomberg. Bloomberg shows uh, uh, this type of implied volatilities by moneyness. These are for one month options. These are for six month, and these are for 12 month options. So I've been showing you mainly 12 months, but, but then this is 80%, 90%, 100% uh, moneyness. So it's stock price, uh, exercise price relative to the current stock price. And if you focused on those, like in 2006, you can see the at the money implied volatility for one month options was 10%. For six month options, it was 13%. It was kind of an upward sloping term structure of volatility. Um, 
And then as we got into uh, uh, 07 and 08 and the markets began to get wild, you can see implied volatility is going to where in October of 08, the implied volatility on, on uh, one month at the money options was 51.4%, 50%. So these were big, historically very large implied volatilities that the market was then building in. But what you can see are the smiles and smirks uh, as, uh, as you see that these are not uh, the same implied volatilities across the exercise price spectrum uh, as the Black-Scholes model assumes. Uh, so uh, we pick all those things up whenever we look at prices based on these. These are really just extracted from prices. So these should be kind of one-to-one -one with market prices. As we look at these implied volatilities, just plug it into the Black-Scholes model, it should give us the market prices uh, of these. And these are pretty heavily traded options. Uh, so I view this as giving us market price data for a variety of different strikes, which is what we need uh, to apply our, uh, our technique. Um, and I have that, uh, uh, you can see how it went up to 50% there on the one year. And then after we uh, hit bottom in March of 09, uh, volatility started coming down, 41, 38, 32, 23, 17. Um, and uh, uh, the economies came back after that. If you look at the most recent data, this is, uh, this is what's going on or what's gone on recently. Now, September of 18 was before the fourth quarter, implied volatility is only 8.7. And in the fourth quarter, we had uh, Trump had trade wars with China uh, and closed down the government. And you can see implied volatility is jumping up. And then that calmed down in 19. But then in 20, here you can see the, uh, as this year, we started a year with an implied volatility of 11.1. And then uh, in March, or at the end of February, it was up to 37. Uh, in March, it went to 49, 69, 77% implied volatility uh, there. So just kind of off the charts, implied volatility with the coronavirus pandemic. And then that came down to 45, 28. And as of last Friday, this is right up to date, right up to Friday, it was back down to 19. Uh, so the markets have calmed down, but this picks up the uh, term structure of volatility. Uh, right now it's 19 for uh, one month options, 24 uh, for six month options, 23 it looks like for 12 month options there. And you've got the, uh, the implied volatilities across strike prices to work with. So we use that data uh, to kind of extract the prices of $1 payoffs, uh, kind of the state prices um, for, uh, based upon the S&P 500. And this is looking at 2005, six, seven, eight, nine, up to 13. And it shows what the at the money implied volatility was. This is for 12 month options. Um, and here's what happened to the S&P, of course, in 05, six, seven, things were pretty strong until, um, until uh, the 08, 09 uh, financial panic. And, I, do, I did think it was a panic. I was involved in it. And I was kind of wiped out in it. And it uh, pleased me when I saw 10 years after uh, Bernanke saying, hey, make no mistake, that was a panic. That was a financial panic. We didn't know where things were going. And you can see then uh, what we have here are the prices of securities that pay off in the left tail, meaning down like 12.5% or more, that pay off down about 10%, pay off down 5%, pay off. Uh, zero, payoff up 5%. So this is kind of up five, up 10%, and right tail, and down five, down 10, and left tail is what I'm looking at here. And I've normalized all these to sum to one. So these are like what you call risk neutral probabilities. Um, and you can see that in like 05, people were paying for the left tail, let's say January 3 of 05, 14 cents of the betting was going there, where for the right tail is 26. And I'm looking at the difference between the left tail and the right tail as in a way a measure of risk aversion. Because if you look down through here, I would normally expect that since the left tail is when the stock market's way down, uh, the economy is in terrible shape then, people should pay up, uh, pay up a lot for securities that pay off then because they have very big 
negative betas. Um, the right tail is very high positive beta, they should sell for low prices. Uh, so if I look at the left tail price minus the right tail price, uh, which is often called the skew uh, of option prices, um, and it goes from minus 12 in the financial panic up to like plus 34. Uh, as the panic started going and people got worried, they started paying instead of 14 and 11 cents, paid 55 and 56 cents out of each dollar for the left tail. And the right tail stayed about 20, 25 uh, because basically volatility was a lot higher. So the probability of being in both tails is higher. Uh, so that kept up the price of the right tail, but, but the risk aversion, risk and risk aversion really caused the left tail prices to skyrocket. And the spread between them then went from minus 12 up to 34. And as things normalized, <clears throat> by the end of 09, it was down to, that spread was down to 20. Uh, and then by the end of uh, 2013, it was down to 10. So I look at this spread mm -hmm. Doug, as- Doug, yeah, you have uh, three, four minutes to fix 20. Okay, that's fine, thanks. Okay, um, yeah, you want time for questions as well. All right, so, th so this is what we're using as the, uh, as uh, extracting from stock option prices. And let me uh, go, to a, go to a graph of that um, and show, for example, this is, this is that, uh, left tail spread minus right tail spread price. And you can see it jump up in the Great Recession. And so I view that as kind of a measure of risk aversion. And it jumps up again in the sovereign debt crisis, jumps up again when the China stock market crash. And you can see in 2020 with the coronavirus pandemic, uh, it went through the roof. So I view it as, uh, and zooming in on the Trump presidency, I have a graph here that zooms in a bit more uh, on that and picks up uh, some additional events there. So this moves around quite a bit. Now the, the final thought that, uh, that I had is, okay, uh, this, this spread between the left tail price and the right tail price for stocks, I think is reflecting a lot of risk aversion. And when risk aversion and fear is very, very high, um, price, stock prices are probably low and the returns and the risks are high, returns are probably in equilibrium high going forward. Uh, so I looked at a correlation of, um, of these stock option, left tail minus right tail with future stock returns, one, two, three, uh, four years in advance, one, two, three, five, and seven years in advance. And these are just the simple correlations. On the next page, I've got uh, some uh, HACT statistics and compared them to those of dividend yield as a forecaster. And I find that the stock market uh, skew basically predicts stock returns better than dividend yields. And I also looked at the left, the low rate price from three year caps and floors, five year and eight to 10. And those are also pretty good predictors of future stock returns. And if people are paying up a lot for very low rates, they're very afraid. Um, the hetero, the uh, T statistics with uh, Nui West adjustments are on the next page. And you can see they're actually, uh, I, I almost don't believe it for the stock market. Some of the T's go up to seven, 13, 25, 26. So the stock market spread between uh, left tail spread, uh, left tail price minus right tail price seems to be a very strong predictor of stock returns. The graph of that is there and you can see uh, this is the graph of the left tail price minus right tail price versus stock returns in the next uh, three years. So last slide is basically in summary, what, uh, what do I see here that, uh, that you can use uh, stock and bond option prices to extract these insurance prices and see the, uh, and measure, monitor the impact of central banks. And also uh, you, you may be able to pick up risk aversion uh, that is helpful in forecasting uh, future stock returns. Let me stop there and open it for questions. Henry. Nine minutes, that's pretty good. I see 721. You told me to give you 10, I've given you nine. <laughs> of course, I skipped about 20 pages. <laughs> Any questions?
any questions? I'll take, I'll go first, I guess. Um, so as a corporate guy, one thing that I can't help thinking about is the fact that the S&P 500 has 500 components. And um, so if you do that kind of analysis at the individual firm level, do you then aggregate up and get consistent, reasonable estimates uh, at the aggregate, or does it, or is like the indiv or are the individual securities so noisy that it's hopeless? Uh, I would think the latter. <laughs> I, I, I think aggregating them up would be a pretty hard thing to do. Um, now I don't know. I, I perhaps I shouldn't be so pessimistic, but I think that if you did it for uh, the problem I see, uh, Murray, it's a good question. The problem I see is that if you have Apple computer uh, versus um, Johnson and Johnson, uh, and you do options on Apple and options on Johnson and Johnson, you can get the prices of claims that pay off when Apple is high or Apple's low and J and J is high or J and J is low. But the times that J and J is high are not the same as the times that Apple is high. And so just adding them up is gonna be adding uh, payoffs from different states, uh, different economic states. I don't think it would it would work very well, uh, honestly. But I haven't thought about it probably like you have. Uh, so uh, that's just a very quick reaction. You probably know more about this than I do. No, I, I'm, I was just wondering because it, it seems like, like I care about individual firms. That's what I'm used to thinking about. Uh -huh. And I'd even be happy, like, give me the Dow 30. Can stick with ones that are pretty big. Yeah. But, but I'd like to be able to know something about whether the, the views sure. that, are, that are being taken of, indi of the individual firms, Apple, J&J, &J or whatever, uh, are reasonable, or is it just yeah. any old weird thing? That was kind of the issue. Well, I think that the Dow 30 would probably give you some pretty sensible results. I, for any particular security, essentially, uh, you're pricing it based upon its expected payoffs conditional upon uh, the level of consumption or the level of the market. Um, that's what comes out of the asset pricing formulas. Uh, so you think of what is the expected payoff given that the S&P 500 is 3,000 versus the expected payoff given that the S&P 500 is 2,000 or 4,000. Uh, that's what you should, would come out in the asset pricing, I would say. You just say that any audience, if you want to raise your, want to ask a question, you can raise your hand. Um, let me just follow up the point. I, I guess it could be a very interesting exercise, Doug, because it, it's going to say something about the correlation between the stocks, the individual stocks. You know, if you do the same exercise on the index and do the same exer the exercise on individual stocks, because the, um, right, the, the total variance include the variance of individual stocks, but also the covariance of them. Uh-huh. Yes, I think it'd be an interesting exercise. And indeed, if you were pricing payoffs on, you know, that company, then its options will help you price other payoffs that are contingent upon that company. So uh, that's for sure. Um, and that might help you pricing like risky bonds uh, of the company or other things that are quite related to that one company, uh, just using its option prices, butterfly spreads of that, you could pick up the state prices based upon that company. Um, but, uh, but I think that diversification is so important that uh, you see that I'm a little hesitant to not have a, uh, a highly diversified portfolio uh, uh, there whenever I'm trying to price assets uh, in a CAPM type of world, thinking in that way. So Doug, in all of the figures that I realize that all your interest rates stop at zero. I guess there's a zero lower bound. But of course, in Europe that we know there's a sustained period, there's interest rate become negative. Like, do you, uh, I wasn't completely sure which option price that you use to use. Do you observe some price for negative interest rates? Yeah, you know, um, that's good. Certainly a good question, Angie. At, at first I had uh, uh, kind of a zero in there uh, in the calculations, uh, as if it, uh, it would never happen below zero, you know, prices or rates would never go below zero. Uh, and that's when I started shifting the analysis from the left tail being uh, bounded by zero to just everything less than one and a half. And you can see in the prices of 
uh, in the prices for uh, euros, uh, euro options, you can see a price for negative rates, uh, as you should, because rates are negative there. Um, so their caps and floors should indeed reflect that, and, and they do. Um, but uh, I don't have really good data on that. The problem is that I don't have uh, long data for the price of a zero strike um, or a zero rate on Eurobor. Uh, or a minus 0.5 rate on Eurobor. I don't have that data. But it should, it should certainly, the prices should pick up the probabilities and the, uh, and the marginal utilities of uh, negative rates. And for negative rates, goodness, think about the marginal utilities. When they're having negative rates, uh, the economy must look kind of scary to somebody there who's keeping the rates down there. Uh, so the marginal utilities probably should be quite high on those. And their uh, prices should, should rather vastly overstate um, uh, their probabilities, I would think, in that situation. Any other questions? I have a comment on Murray's question and the follow-up. There are people that have worked on um, trying to um, get multivariate or bivariate distributions. Uh, from um, state prices, uh, but they, it's very difficult because um, you try to estimate a multi-dimensional object from, you know, essentially two-dimensional set of prices. So uh, they can do that, but only uh, by making assumptions like constant correlations or something like that. So. Right, yeah. I remember looking at things like that some time ago and made a little progress, but it just seemed uh, too messy and I, I kind of gave up on it, I guess. Um, what we need is a more liquid derivative markets that trade, you know, sub brackets of multivariate states. Yes, that's right. Uh, <laughs> that would be good. I, you know, I would like some industry options, uh, you know, banking industry versus tech and things like that. That would be pretty, uh, pretty useful. Now, of course, we've got credit default swaps uh, and we've got those for industries as well as individual uh, companies. And I'm sure people have analyzed that. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not up on all the research that's been done there, but I would hope that there has been some good research on credit default swaps. I mean, if you look at the prices of uh, the banking industry versus the individual banks credit default swaps, it's kind of what you're talking about, Murray, I think there. Uh, and it would have Citibank, JP Morgan, Bank of America and so on. Uh, as individual, and then you'd have the uh, uh, the industry uh, credit default swaps. Although that actually it occurs to me, the industry credit default swaps though are not an option on a portfolio, are they? They are actually a portfolio of options. Uh, in that, uh, uh, if if one goes up and the other goes down, you get compensated for the one that, that gets hit. Uh, you can you can cash in on that. So. That's not easy analysis when you've got so many uh, correlations there. All right, uh, I see 7.30 there. Did you, any other questions or something? I know you're trying to stick with it. Or um, I guess maybe a, like I guess we should stop at six. But one more question, Doc. So when you talk about the you know difference between left and tail, left tail and right tail, and you're you're saying there's a risk aversion. Like I mean, it could be you know probability could be risk aversion. Like you know what? What's your thoughts on why? Like why are you seem to think it's the risk aversion, not probability? Yeah, I do. I actually that reminds me of a slide that I skipped over when you were telling me I just had uh, five minutes or three minutes, uh, and that's this slide where essentially I on this slide I've got the first three bars are these prices of the left tail payoffs. Uh, first one is for 2015, 16, and 2017, and then this last bar is actually last Friday. This is 731 of 20. Okay, so this is the price of the left tail. This is the price of the down 10%, down five, zero, up five, up 10, 
and right tail. Now, what I compared them to, though, is historic frequencies. I thought, okay, how many times do we have we had a decline of 12.5%? What fraction of the time does the stock market drop by 12.5% or more? What are the frequencies? You might think of them as probabilities, but they're historic frequencies. And I thought, I'll do that with the Ibbotson data set, 1927 to 2015. It was 1926, the one year starts you 1927, so 90 years of data. And this, these um, checked ones, let's see, um, the, blue check, the blue hash ones, this is Ibbotson's data set. And then this is, and then you might say, oh, but this time is different. You know, the last 20 years are different. And if you look at the last 20 years, first one was the last 90 years, uh, there's not much difference between the last 20 years and the last 90 years as far as historical frequencies, okay? Um, but what you see is it kind of jumps out at you is that the right tail happens almost half the time of being up 10% in this. Now, part of it is, uh, of course, the mean return on the S&P 500 over the last 90 years was close to 10%. So the mean is that. So up 10% is, is not one standard deviation away from the mean, it is the mean. Uh, so anyway, but if you look at those frequencies versus the prices, it's like prices are way less than the frequencies there. And prices on the left tail are way more than the frequencies. Uh, I see. And if you look at the plus five and minus five, I compare those as well. Compare like the 95 with the 105s. Look at these, you know, the, the 95 is the down five. This is down 5%. This is up 5%. I mean, is the world really that skewed? These prices versus these prices. I view that as kind of risk aversion in the small and risk aversion in the large is the way I'm thinking of those and the way I'm talking about them. Comparing plus five minus five, plus 10 minus 10, I see risk aversion in the small as well as risk aversion in the large. Now there was actually, when I was doing this, I was on a Fed panel in 2017 uh, in Washington where they were worried that volatilities in 27 were too low. You know, people were just kind of uh, not, not anticipating that bad things can happen. And sure enough, in 2018, some bad things did happen later. Um, but they were looking at that and volatilities were very, very low. And you saw that the uh, prices of the left tail came way down and there was not much risk aversion then, came down close to historic frequencies. Um, but then it, then it blasted back out at the present time. I, I think there's, if you look into the data pretty, uh, pretty deeply- Right, you see so you observe some physical frequency of of these yeah. events and you can say something about whether that's risk aversion or just- Yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. Now I would say that if you look at the uh, very short time periods, like three months, sometimes you'll see that people are paying a lot more for the upside than for the downside. And that almost looks like risk seeking behavior or else there's something weird about the distribution. But I did see as I looked at the one month data, the three month, the six month, kind of not much risk aversion showing in the one, three, and six, as in the 12 and 24. And it really made me feel that, that the 12 month options and the 24 month options must be dominated more by hedgers, hedge behavior. It just seemed like they reflected more risk aversion than the one and three uh, options. So that's just an observation from having looked at these uh, for a few years. Is there a break point around November? Around November, uh, <laughs> coming up uh, this November. <laughs> that uh, you no, know, in actually, the price, you know, in the prices, like you were saying, right. the short run prices, um, if they were ending before November versus those that extend beyond November. Yeah, uh, uh, you you certainly see some effect on it. It was really, I've got one of the graphs in here that surprised me, uh, which was uh, uh, this one. I, I maybe it's table here. That's October 30 of 16, the implied volatilities, you know, basically when Trump was elected or when the election happened, what happened? Um, and the implied volatilities actually came down uh, in many cases then. And actually, those are not implied volatilities. Um, 
but the implied volatilities did come down uh, after the election. And well, that's perhaps plausible. Uncertainty was resolved. I, I, I wouldn't take it that the markets thought he was going to fix everything. Uh, that didn't work, I guess, totally. But uh, in any case, uncertainty was resolved there, just as it will be. We hope it will be resolved in November with the voting issues. Uh, you know, we may not know who the president is in the month of November, I guess. Uh, <laughs> to comment on that question, actually, if you go look in, uh, it's a very easy way to look at this. Uh, if you go look at, look at beyond options, you can look at VIX futures. And there's a huge bump in the VIX futures uh, curve uh, in October. So the October VIX futures contract is very expensive compared to uh, the, the September and uh, November and December. And uh, over, okay, yeah. You can see it versus November and December yeah. uh, versus September. I guess, um, I guess you could say that the resolution of uncertainty will be greater in October than it is in September. Right. The, the, the curve is hump shaped with a peak in October. Um, so yeah. that's the closest maturity to the election. Yeah, that's plausible to me that it would be hump shaped, I would say. I would think it would come down after the, uh, begin to come down after the election. Just, uh, it's, it's an integral, right? Of, it's an integral of daily volatility. I so the bet on it's a bet on VIX, where VIX is going to be uh, at the time of the uh, maturity of the contract. So it's yeah. kind of a bet on where the option market will be then. Yeah, that's so. true. And, uh, actually, uh, a standard question I put on my uh, uh, my exams for the students a lot of times is, you know, what's the beta of the VIX, and how should those options uh, and securities be priced? And of course. Uh, there's a very strong relationship that when stock prices fall, volatility goes up. Uh, so the VIX uh, contracts must have a very negative beta. And so they should be priced very high in relation to probabilities uh, and uh, returns from buying VIX futures uh, should be quite low, should be a negative risk premium, I would think, uh, because they're diversifiers for you. Yeah. Yeah, and that, and that beta is very large. I think it's like my, for the VIX spot, it's my, minus five or six or something. Yeah, well, it makes 